evil is at the gate. Daniel chapter 5, we're beginning at verse 1 to 6, then 17 to 30. Belshazzar, the king, made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in the presence of the thousand. While he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave the command to bring the gold and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple which had been in Jerusalem, that the king and his lords and his wives and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken from the temple of the house of God which had been in Jerusalem, and the king, his lords, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze and iron, wood and stone. In the same hour, the fingers of a man's hand appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance changed and his thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his hips were loosened and his knees knocked against each other. Verse 17. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar your father a kingdom and majesty, glory and honor. And because of the majesty that he gave him, all peoples, nations and languages trembled and feared before him. Whomever he wished, he executed. Whomever he wished, he kept alive. Whomever he wished, he set up. And whomever he wished, he put down. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne and they took his glory from him. Then he was driven from the sons of men. His heart was made like the beasts and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. They fed him with grass like oxen and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till he knew that the Most High God rules in the kingdom of men and appoints over it whomever he chooses. But you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although you knew all this, and you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. They brought the vessels of his house before you, and you and your lords, your wives, and your concubines have drunk wine from them. And you've praised the gods of silver and gold, bronze and iron, wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know. And the God who holds your breath in his hand and who owns all your ways, you have not glorified. Then the fingers of the hand were sent from him and this writing was written. And this is the inscription that was written. Mene, mene, tekel, ifarsin. This is the interpretation of each word. Mene, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tikal, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command and they clothed Daniel with purple, and put a chain of gold around his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain. There was quite a history this particular nation and there's no excuse for the ignorance and of how we took evil and we mixed it with a perverse religion a perverted understanding of Jesus Christ a personal interpretation of the scriptures that had no grounding whatsoever in truth going to church claiming to be touched by the power of God and doing the exact opposite of what the cross was actually all about what do we do what did Belshazzar do? But you, Daniel 5.22, his son Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although you knew all of this. In other words, you continued in your pride and your rebellion against God, though you knew that you truly do reap what you have sown, though you truly understood God will not be mocked. You cannot pervert truth and expect his blessing. Verse 23 says, you've lifted up yourselves against the Lord of heaven. You brought the vessels of his house before you. You and your lords, your wives, your concubines have drunk wine from them. And you praise the gods of silver and gold. That's the gods of prosperity. 
bronze and iron, that's the gods of human strength and ingenuity, wood and stone. Again, the gods of human accomplishment, invisible things that have been accomplished in the nation. And the God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all your ways, you've not glorified. In this nation, we allowed preachers to be raised up unchallenged, absolute frauds, absolute charlatans. We taught the people of this nation that somehow godliness is a means to financial gain, just as the apostle Paul warned in 1 Timothy and chapter six. We praise the gods of silver and gold. Even today, services where the whole focus is gold and silver, human strength and visible accomplishment. And then suddenly the writing of the hand of God appears on the wall of this nation. My brother, my sister, listen to me. If you can't see the hand of God right now, something is wrong. You just have to look at the character of those that are running for political office to understand what I'm talking about. The writing is on the wall. In this hour in which we're not, we're now living. God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Verse 28, he says, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. And here's what I believe, that America is on the verge of being given to the godless. We're right on the edge now. The godless have already largely come into our society. The value system of the godless is being imposed on the nation. Are you okay with people going into our schools and telling our little boys they might be girls and our little girls they might be boys? Are you okay with that? We're on the verge of something darker, something deeper than anything we could ever have imagined. We're on the verge of losing everything this nation has ever stood for, even though it was perverted at times. There still was a willingness to turn back to God and to deal in truth and deal in reality. The irony of it all is that Belshazzar was so gospel hardened that he could recognize that the voice was, that was speaking to him was speaking on God's behalf, but he could not bend his knee to it. I see Belshazzar getting up from the table. Daniel's just told him, your kingdom is over. It's finished. It's going to be given to somebody else. All the history of Babylon, all the conquering, all that's all, all the, the blessing that's ever, it's all now going to be given to somebody else because you have stood in mockery against the God of heaven. You've exalted yourselves in pride and you have not challenged this perverse religion that has risen up among you. I see Belshazzar getting up from the table, walking over to Daniel and the scripture says he issued a proclamation, just like a, the mayor issued a proclamation allowing prayer in the square to happen. I proclaim Daniel, the third ruler in the kingdom. Well, Daniel just told him your kingdom is over. And so they rise up, his attendants rise up and they take a gold chain and they put it around his neck. How, how incredulous it must have seemed to Daniel. Oh God, to be standing before people and telling them, warning them, speaking on God's behalf. And everybody says it, it's true. It's the voice of God. It's the proper interpretation of the moment in history that we are now at. And they give accolades, but they can't bend their knee. Belshazzar should have been on his knees. He should have been crying out for mercy. Historians tell us that the Medes and Persians were already at the gate and they apparently entered the city without any resistance. As Daniel is speaking, the Belshazzar, the Medes, and the Persians were already at the gate. And the people from within the city, instead of defending it, just opened the gate and let them flood the land. And that very night, the scripture says, Belshazzar, the king of the Babylonians, they call him the Chaldeans here, was slain. And today, I want to tell you that evil is at the gate in America. The question arises, what will we do? As the church of Jesus Christ, we are the only ones left with the power to resist it. There's no other power. Jesus said to the P Peter and subsequently to us in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. And it was based on the statement that Peter had made. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And he says, Peter, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. 
my point this morning is that you and I have the power to push back the darkness. We have the power. We don't have to let the gate open and let this nation be flooded by a darkness that is so unspeakably evil. We don't have to do it unless we choose to, unless we become like Belshazzar and his whole entourage who just agree with the word of God, but can't do anything about it. All they can do is decorate the prophets. Talk about, yes, this is God. Yes, this is a man of God. Yes, this is a word from God, but don't do anything. They should have turned to prayer. They should have been up from the table. They should have been calling out the troops. They should have been barricading the gates. Instead, they're decorating the man who just told them your kingdom is over. It's finished. Second Chronicles 7, 14, God said to his own people, Israel, my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. 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 Will admit that our ways are not God's ways. We'll admit that we have failed to be a light to this generation. We'll, we'll admit that we've not done what we should do. We'll admit that we've pursued pleasure more than God. We'll admit that our relationship with God has fallen far short of what it should be, or this nation would not be in the condition it's in today. Not only do we have churches on every corner, we got three in between the churches on every corner, and we're not even affecting our streets, let alone our community. They'll humble themselves and pray seek my face and turn from their wicked ways you see when you start seeking the face of god you're going to find out not everything in your heart is right not everything you're holding on to is correct theft is wrong evil speech is wrong wrong relationships are it's it's there's so many things when we begin to seek the face of god he will show us and as we make the choice to turn the Bible tells us that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. A man or woman that says, I'm going with God. I'm going to live for God. I'm, my life's going to be a testimony and I'm going to pray. I'm not going to lay down and let the devil roll over this generation. You see, there's always hope. And even though the Medes and Persians did take over that society, Daniel, because he was a righteous man, was technically transported into the next society and given favor. And he became one of the vessels that God used to influence the king, to sign a decree, to let God's people go back to the promised land, begin to rebuild the testimony of the Lord again. And so there's hope, no matter how dark it gets, there's hope for you and there's hope for me. It's never over as long as Christ is still sitting at the right hand of Almighty God and he has a people on the earth. And my plea to the church of Jesus Christ in this nation is turn away from sin. Agree with God. What God says is sin. Agree with God that it is sin and trust him for the power to turn away from it. And let your heart turn from self-seeking and self-focus to the needs of others around you. That's why Daniel said, break off your sins by being righteous and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. In other words, Nebuchadnezzar, you're so focused on yourself, you're blind to what the work of God really is. It's about the poor, the marginalized, the disadvantaged, the nobodies and nothings of society. Everybody else is not seen because they can't help their agenda, but God sees them and that's the center of his heart. It's why he went to the cross. Show mercy to the poor. Get away from the self-focus of those that sit and drink wine and praise the gods of gold and silver and bronze and iron and wood and stone. Get away from these frauds and their powerless religion and begin to pray. My brother, my sister, if ever there was a time to pray, it's now. Because evil is at the gate. And if we don't pray, if we don't pray, I want to ask you what kind of a country are we going to be giving to our children and our grandchildren? What kind of evil is going to invade the classroom deeper than that which is already there? What kind of laws are going to be passed obligating the church of Jesus Christ to become partakers of this nation's sin? I want you to think long and hard about this because we are at the moment where evil is at the gate. We don't have five years to get this right. 
pray that you and I not be like Belshazzar and his company, that we can sit here today or listen online and hear these words and yet do nothing. Put a gold chain on the preacher's neck. Declare him or her to be man or woman of God, whatever your case is, but do nothing. I challenge the churches listening to me online that are prayerless. Start to pray. Somebody, for the sake of God and for this nation, somebody somewhere start to pray. If they won't open the building, start in your home. Start a prayer meeting in your home. We're at a crisis point now. You see, it can either be averted in measure because I honestly believe that God is good and His mercy endures forever. I honestly believe that America can experience a third great awakening, a spiritual awakening before that final day of judgment comes to this whole world. I believe that God can touch our children. God can touch our churches. God can touch our neighborhoods. I believe that with all of my heart. But I also know something else. There's never been a great awakening anywhere at any time in history without somebody somewhere praying and laying hold of God. It all begins with prayer. And so I challenge you now to pray. I plead with you to pray. I plead with you. God, help all of us to get out of ourselves. Our focus on ourselves. Everything is about ourselves. Help us, Lord God, to understand there's a, a greater battle at hand. and There's much more at stake today than we realize. We're only months away if we don't pray from being in a position where we wished we had. We have the power, do you understand? We have the power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. We have the power to move mountains and command them to be cast into the sea. We have promises from Jesus Christ himself that whatever we ask, believing we shall receive. We're not powerless. We, we are not just spectators watching this godless parade go by. We have the power to hold the gates because the Bible says the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church of Jesus Christ. We have the power to stand at the gates and resist evil. We have the power to push back darkness. We have the power to believe God for his spiritual awakening. We have the power to call down heaven. For Christ to exalt his own name in this generation, something that you and I can't do, but he can. He can exalt his own name again. We have the power. He's given it into the hand of his church. It's always been there. If we're willing to walk in truth, if we're willing to do it God's way, we have the power. He has provided to us everything that we need. He's given us his blood to cleanse us from all sin, to, to break the chains as we sang this morning and to set us free. He's given us the power to live in freedom. He's given us the power to walk away from that which captivates the hearts of un ungodly men and women. He's given us the power to live a new life. He's given us promises to be everything that God declares that we should be. We have no excuse to live in spiritual poverty. It was all done on the cross for us. And he left us here as co-laborers with him to win a harvest and to bring glory to his name. And I happen to believe that we do not have to surrender this nation or this city into the hands of darkness. I believe that with all my heart. I'm not living a pipe dream. I know who God is. I know what he's done in my life. I know what I've seen him do, do throughout the world. I've watched him at work. I know his heart. And so I plead with you. Pray. Walk righteously. Otherwise your prayers are pointless. And so it comes down to this one thought that never leaves my heart. It's time to pray. It's time now. Not tomorrow. Not next month. Today. That's why the writer of Hebrews says, today, if you can hear his voice, don't harden your heart. If you can hear it. Remember, in the book of Ezekiel, the Lord said, I sought for a man that I should not have to judge the nation, but couldn't find one. I can see the Spirit of God going through the streets of that which was a nation at that time known for its religion. Will you stand, sir? Will you stand, ma'am? Will you stand with me? Will you stand with me? And the people were just probably so busy as we are today. I've got children to raise. I got groceries to get. I got a job I got to go to. 
I work long hours. Will you, sir, stand? And you can hear God pleading to not have to judge the nation, but everybody is finding an excuse, unaware of the moment in history that they're living in. But by God's grace, as Paul the Apostle said to one of the churches, in my heart, I have a vision of better things of you. And I believe that in this room and online, there are men and women who will take seriously this call, who will not put this plea from the Holy Spirit away, who will understand that we do live in perilous times, who will get up and say, I will go to the gate. I will go and I will stand. And I will intercede and I will trust God for the strength to push back the plans of darkness, to destroy our society. I will, I will by the strength of Almighty God. I will because of the victory of the cross for me. I will because I have the promises of God that he will make me more than I am and give me more than I could ever hope to possess. I will because his blood has cleansed me and made me righteous. I will by the grace of God, I will. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus.